going. Hello there, 585ers. Tonight, we're going to move on to Module 2. Um, do not think that just because we've set uh, Fulton aside that we will not come back and visit him. We will be back to see the good doctor in a few. Um, but the reason why we're doing what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks, if not three weeks, is we need to understand the various ways that people look at integrating technology into your classroom. Now, there are two ways of looking at that. Um, and this is where this comes in about conceptual and theoretical frameworks. And I'll run this by you. I'm not going to spend a lot of different, a lot of time with it because you can read this right here. And I'm not going to even go through this entire thing. I just need to show you a couple of slides here. These frameworks are built around people doing research, both of them. Um, and so at first, as teachers, you were like, well, I don't do research. I'm not a university person. The point is, you do do research as a teacher. You just do it very informally. And at one time, that form of research, which is labeled action research, was kind of poo-pooed upon by people in the ivory towers of universities. It was like, oh, we don't do that. that that's not important. Actually, it turns out it's probably the most important kind of research we can do. The only people who can do research that has real weight is like our friend that we looked at in our last getting together, uh, Dr. Hattie. Uh, if you remember, Dr. Hattie had the distinction of having, what, three quarters of a billion data points in, in his uh, database. We have a gentleman here, good friend named Terry Scott. And Dr. Scott has a database, not as big as that, but buddy, it's a big old database. And his focus of research is PBIS, positive behavior, um, positive behavior intervention strategy. Excuse me, I had to fix something there. So when Terry goes out and he talks about positive behavior intervention strategies, and he's in a room full of Oh, I'm not going to say senior teachers, but how about seasoned teachers? Um, everybody kind of rolls their eyes and, you know, says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And until Terry shows them his research and his data points. And then it's like, look, you know, if I walked in here and I had done some little research on 15 kids, which, by the way, you can do a Ph.D. on. Uh, but if I had done that on just like 15 kids, you there'd be all kinds of arguments you could make at me about, well, yeah, you got 15 kids who are all middle-class kids and are going to go on to college and so on. And so your little PBIS would matter to them, but no, Terry can stand there and he can say, no, I, I have over a hundred thousand some odd kids. Now you have to start paying attention because not only are there a hundred thousand kids, in other words, it's a number, but it's also across demographics and it's longitudinal. It's not snapshots. It's data that's been collected over time. And that's the data you want. Be extremely, extremely careful of people who walk in and go, I have the answer. Last year, we implemented this program at blah, blah, blah. And we found that kids improve, blah, blah, blah. Hattie just told you that in that video. It's called the Hawthorne Effect, by the way. So, you know, it's like, those kinds of folks who come in and usually they're trying to sell something. We should look at that with a great deal of skepticism because what we need to realize is longitudinal data will always carry the day when it comes to looking at is something going on here that really matters. So they're all about all these frameworks that we're going to be looking at here in just a minute are all about identification of key concepts and the relationships among these concepts. Boy, this is, T, this is TPAC's definition right here. And so what we're trying to get at here is we're trying to understand a phenomenon. 
Well, what's the phenomenon? The phenomenon that we're looking at is technology integrated into a classroom, technology integrated into teaching, two different things, by the way. And we're going to look at ways of looking at both of those. And that is one of the problems that we have. Uh, when I had my job back in Jefferson County Public Schools, we did lots of data looking at why we were seeing reticence on the part of teachers to embrace this wonderful wave of technology that we were willing to give to them 10 years ago, 10 years ago. So at that time, we were doing things that was unheard of. We were giving teachers their own laptops to use and projectors. And at the time, we were using a device from HP that had a foldable screen that then it would turn into a, a, a writing tablet. Now, it looked nothing like the ones that you see today. It was the first sort of pass at that. HP had built all of these particular computers thinking that they were going to snap up the medical market. In other words, doctors, nurses would walk in and would have these devices under their arms. They were laptops. But then because their screens could be written on, they could then enter all of their data and sign off on reports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Went over like a lead balloon in the medical industry. <laughs> and so what happened was HP had literally warehouses of these things because they kind of bet the farm on this was where technology was headed. Now, again, I can't stress this was 10, 11, 12 years ago. And we were just starting to start seeing the kind of devices, iPad, that were coming out. Well, so when that happened, we, the people who were in charge of helping teachers understand this great new technology, we said, look, the analogy we're doing here is it's like your old overhead projector. You can write right on the screen, but you could also annotate. So in other words, if you had a website that you wanted to use, if you had um, a particular website that shows kids different things about what you're teaching, and you could then annotate with your stylus writing on the screen, so on and so on. Nowadays, they give out Chromebooks to everybody. But the same, it's the same kind of idea. And here was what's so interesting. So for my perspective as the person in charge of professional development for these teachers. I wasn't all that concerned about kids and the technology. Kids are always going to be ahead of us in technology, not because they're born with iPads and computers and phones in their hands. They're born with a lack of fear. They're born with a lack of preset ideas about technology. So what we were looking at was the penetration of the technology into classrooms. In other words, are people using them? We weren't really interested in all that much in how they were using them. We just wanted to know, are you hooking this stuff up and using it? Again, remember, the projector and the computer were pretty much connected to each other. The projector wasn't hung from a ceiling with a wall jack and a plug and all of that. They were pretty much, you know, we went out, we bought them carts so they could have the cart and the projector and the computer all sitting together. That was a disaster. So we slowly kind of fumbled our way through it. But here was the thing that we kept running into. We never got above, get ready, 28% penetration. 28% of teachers actively using their technology. Now, what does that mean? Well, we would go in and we would sit and we observed. And what we tried to do was to come in randomly. Obviously, you didn't want to come in announced. You, you, you came in and the 
school administration knew you were coming in. But we didn't want to be able to say, now, 2 o'clock next Thursday, we're going to walk in your building and see what teachers are doing with technology. For the obvious reasons. Dog and pony shows would suddenly occur everywhere. We just wanted to see what it was. So we picked people who would come in and would just wouldn't be a threat. Uh, they could come in and just sit quietly in a corner and just observe and then report back. All up and down the grade levels, elementary, middle, and high. The best penetration we had were math teachers. But stop and think about it. <laughs> you know, that analogy of the overhead projector rang true with them. I remember going in and watching a guy at Wagner High School here in Louisville who um, was a Algebra 2 teacher, good Algebra 2 teacher. And, and by the way, we also didn't pick the teachers. I let the, I let the principals do that. Now, you know, people who are, who do research right now would be screaming at me, there's a threat to your validity of your research right there. Yep, sure was. But I was willing to accept that because I wanted I wanted principals to buy into what we were trying to do. So I figured I'd give them the power to pick who we would go to, and they would send us to, you know, probably the best. That's okay. You know, but I also wanted to see the worst, and I did get to see the worst because some principals didn't care. You know, they just said, well, who do you want to go visit? I don't know. Send me somebody. But I did get sent to this guy, and he was a really good Algebra two teacher. And as we were sitting there talking one day, he said, come here, I want to show you something. And he walked me over to his storage closet and he opened it up in neatly, because this guy was, he was a perfectionist, neatly stacked in his storage closet were these boxes of the sheets, the rolled up sheets from his overhead projector. And he would open, and, any, and every box had a label on it that would told you what he was using that particular sheet for. And he said, it took me a long time, he said, but I finally got all of this into my computer because what you could do is writing on this tablet, you could save it. Um, oh, gosh, it was, a, it was a Microsoft product and it was called writing. I, I can't remember exactly the name. It might be on this computer. Let's look real fast just to see. Chuckles. This is tin. And most people think of tin as being put on machines that have, uh, you know, touch screens. So let's see if it's on here. It was called Microsoft Notebook. That's what it was called. And it allowed you to write on the screens. And I don't see it here. So, you know, that's fine. Well, and we did show them this voice recorder so they could write on their screen and they could record what they were saying at the same time if they wanted to okay that's enough of that so the idea was we kept looking at what teachers were doing with the technology i want to go a couple more on this so what we're trying to do is we try to look at concepts that have very high levels of ab abstraction that have general meanings. They've been using the construct associated with the concept of anxiety. Mine would be the idea of teacher adaptation or teacher adoption of technology use in their teaching. So what we were trying to do was to look at things in a very, very narrow focus um, and then we were looking at it through a lens of teacher use. All right. Now let's go talk about this. So TPAC, I'm not going to play the video, but I really want you to watch the video. So when you get a chance to do that, it's very short, very to the point. You won't have any trouble with it. Um, but I will take us on a little tour and I'm going to start here. This was the beginnings 
the first pulling all the data together and pulling the ideas together by two gentlemen, Mishra and Kohler. Uh, they were two research uh, guys out of the University of Michigan. No, I'm sorry, Michigan State, excuse me, Michigan State. And it was presented at a site, Society for Instructional Technology and Education, in 2008. And so if you, if you want, I am not going to run these past you. This is 45 minutes worth of videos right here, okay? But if you want to hear it all and see it all from the beginning, that's where it was. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold your hand. And I'm going to take you through this. And yes, it's a PowerPoint. Yes, you can scream and yell. But this is my PowerPoint. And this is the one that I use to explain to people TPAC. So I'm comfortable with it. How about that? This is the TPAC framework. And what's so interesting about this, as sort of an aside, is if you look at most research frameworks that are done at an education level, they look like this. <laughs> they look like circles, three, usually it's three circles, and it's a Venn diagram, and then they go on from there. But I'm going to go ahead and walk you through this. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time in it. I'm just going to get through so you can see the point of it. TPAC is integrating technology into teaching, and that's a wicked problem. Integrating technology into teaching is viewed as a wicked problem. That's truly a term, a sociology term, uh, created by a guy by the name of C. West, West Churchman. It, and it means that a wicked problem is that requirements are incomplete, contradictory, and changing. Oh, boy, if that ever isn't the truth. And all you got to do is just look back five years. You don't have to go back over long periods of time. But look at how quickly and how... Uh, demonstrably, technology use in schools has changed. And it's always going to change because technology is not driven by factors in education. It's driven by factors in the consumer space. No two wicked problems are the same. Solutions are difficult to realize. Solutions are not right or wrong. Solutions do not have stopping rules. There you are, the wicked problem of technologies. Solutions are difficult to realize because once we get something established in use, then something else will come along to replace it. We never have the right answer or the wrong answer. People, here's the word you hear here that is this, standardization. So people think that all we have to do is have a standardized platform of technology and then everything else just melts away. These are the folks that want to see all Macintoshes or all Windows machines. Heck, you even have people who will argue about having Windows 7 machines versus Windows 10 machines. Or you'll have people now, of course, talking about Chromebooks. There is no right or wrong answer. And there are no stopping rules. Once we give everybody a piece of technology, we'll be ready to go. Nope, <laughs> doesn't happen that way. Uh, there's a there there is the you have to always help from John doing in a presentation. So there's mine, and I won't do those because those have changed. Let's talk about TPAC. So TPAC is made up of three pieces, even though the acronym has four letters. The first, and, and I go backwards because I think that this is the way it should be done. Bear with me. The most important thing that you have to have as a teacher is teacher knowledge of your content. If you're always one page ahead of the kids and you're teaching, then everybody's in trouble. If you're one page ahead in the textbook of what your kids are learning, you're in trouble. So teacher content knowledge is always, always first in any, in, in any 
discussion about technology integration. I can't expect a new teacher to arrive on the scene with technology knowledge as the first thing that I want to address. The first thing we always need to address is content knowledge. How well do you know how, how to teach? And, ah, and that takes us to the next one, pedagogy. So now we move from that sort of, I know what I'm talking about to how am I going to present it and how am I going to get the kids engaged in it? Pedagogy. So we have content and pedagogy. This was research that was done in 1987 by a guy by the name of Lee Shulman. Um, his picture is is out here on the wall here in our college. He's a Grommeyer Award winner. And so what Shulman basically says, said back in 1987, was that the interplay between content and pedagogy is where we see the really, truly good teachers. Good teachers don't have one pedagogy. You know, you, you look at that and you smile because I'm a university person sitting here and I'm using one pedagogy. Well, actually, I'm using a couple. But the main pedagogy in most university uh, experiences is somebody lecturing at you. And we know that there is a place for lecture in good teaching. If I'm teaching something that's new to kids, that has vocabulary that is unknown to them, I must employ a lecture style of pedagogy to say, here is the new word. This is what it looks like. This is how it's spelled. This is its definition. Now, I don't stop there. I then quickly move into, let's, let's go into groups and together, Let's come up with what you think would be examples of how this vocabulary word is applied to your experience. We, we send kids off on doing little scavenger hunts to find the use of the words because we have all this technology available to us. We employ multiple pedagogies to enforce our content that we're trying to, to deliver. Now, this is, this is straight out of a showman thing, and I'm going to read it to you because there's some really good stuff buried here. If those preconceptions, and everybody comes to the table with preconceptions about content knowledge, if those preconceptions are misconceptions, which they so often are, teachers need knowledge of strategies most likely to be fruitful in reorganizing the understanding of learners because those learners unlikely to appear before them as blank slates. We all bring prior knowledge to whatever task that we do. In another class, we talk about something called constructivism. And it is a, it is a theory of learning by a gentleman by the name of John Abbott. I actually met Dr. Abbott. John Abbott, I argued, was it's not a theory, it's reality. Constructivism is how you and I approach the world, how we approach learning. And I don't mean sitting in classrooms. It's how we approach everything. When we are confronted with a new whatever it might be, we immediately go into our library of prior knowledge, of prior uh, activities, and then we try to find something in there that makes a connection to the new knowledge that we're being asked to do. You also see this with people who are presented with new tasks. They'll bring to the fro the way that they learned about the previous tasks to help them understand. And so when we have that as that is the reality, and we are then presenting new information to students, what we're trying to do is to help them see through various 
pedagogical measures how things connect up. And that's a stupid cartoon. I don't know if you can see it. It basically says, I asked my catering students to take everything with a grain of salt, but I, but with my plasterers, I lay it on with a drought. And basically what we're trying to say here is pedagogies can be different depending upon discipline, but what really separates the teacher who is struggling day to day with the great teachers is, is that facility of shifting between pedagogies to help kids understand their content. I call it the pedagogical dance. Um, I used to have a cool little slide I'd put in here of two people dancing and so on and so on. I took it out. Now let's add that last part in to the T pack. So far we've had the C content knowledge, the C and the K, and we've had the P and the K, which is pedagogical knowledge. Now let's talk about the technology knowledge. This is where we hear the kinds of metaphors used of the teacher's toolkit, the teacher's facility of using technology. And it can look anything and everything like how comfortable are you with running your computer connected to a projector and then presenting information into the classroom or or switching to a different pedagogy the technology of the laptop or whatever connected to a projector is used to organize the students in the classroom into collaboration groups or or the computer is used to send out to the kids who also have computers how to organize themselves into groups within the classroom to do research say using Google Classroom. So the technology becomes the way in which the pedagogical dance can happen, but it's not the only way. The tool should always be the last piece chosen. As I said, I have a problem with this acronym. It ought to be something like CPAT or CPET, actually. So it ought to be something like content pedagogy. That's where the E comes from. Content pedagogy and technology. Well, maybe the A then fits in there. So maybe it could be CPAT. But I think the problem that TPAC has with a lot of people who look at it is because the T is the first in the acronym, everybody thinks that's what you're focused on. You are not. What you're focused on is how does technology come into play as a way of enhancing that pedagogical content dance, the moving in and out of different pedagogies and the delivery of content. So TPAC is nothing more than the intersection of all three of these ideas. So people will say that that's an impossible thing to do. It is not. It just requires creative solutions. Creativity is seen as novelty. Novelty must be joined to purpose. So if we look at it, we can see that we have new sub -ac acronym, if you want, under TPAC called new, novel, effective, and whole. And so when we look at those meanings, we can see that novel is creativity, radical, unique. So we're looking at something like the use of Chromebooks in a classroom where every kid has one. How is it effectively changing, changing that classic triumvirate that Wiggins and McTighe always talk about, which is acquisition of knowledge, demonstrations of knowledge, and transfer of knowledge? How does it effectively cause that to happen? And then to me, the whole gestalt. In other words, how is the technology a part of the classroom? Is it given over 
as just something that's in the classroom, go watch good kindergarten teachers teach. And one of the things that you watch, you notice right away, is how well they have the classroom materials organized. Who is my table person to go and get the crayons? Who is the person to go get the scissors? Who is the person to go get the, you know, and you have these little baskets they bring to the table and so on, so on, so on. Now you're starting to see a picture of what we think technology in a classroom should look like. It should be the tool, not first, not foremost. It should be the tool that when we are ready, we turn to and we implement into the classroom. All right. I don't think I need to go much further than this. Oh, I do. I do. Sorry about that. Tweaking the knobs. <laughs> this is probably. The, okay. What we just talked about was that sort of. How do we look at technology, content, and pedagogy working? Now we move over to the realm of the things that we can use. They call it tweaking the knobs. They being uh, Punya and Kohler call it tweaking the knobs. Their definition of it is affordances that teachers create through playful interaction with their curriculum. This is where every technology integration project in schools will fail. If this one slide is not acknowledged and allowed to happen. Affordance that teachers create through playful interaction with their curriculum. So what's an affordance? The break in your car is an affordance. It's something you use to make something else happen. You push on it with your foot, you stop the car. So the affordances that we're talking about here are the various tools, technology that is available to teachers. Uh, we'll finish this up with a really nice graphic that everybody uses. <laughs> um, think about it. If I don't give teachers an opportunity to use the tool in a meaningful way, in a way that is a fail-safe way, in other words, you screw it up, it's not the end of the world, you don't have a room full of kids all sitting there getting all excited and jumpy and everything, why isn't it working, Mrs. Smith? You have the, the ability to have those interactions and then when you get comfortable with the tool then look at how it fits into your curriculum which is where TIM which is another acronym that we'll be playing with that's where it comes in all right I could show you examples I'm not going to I want to get to this last here you go TPAC stages so these are the, the stages that we see that TPAC goes through or that teachers go through who are looking at TPAC uh, or research who are looking at TPAC as a way of looking at how teachers are integrating technology in their classroom. This was developed by a lady by the name of Maggie Neese, 2009. Um, she is a professor of mathematics at... University of Oregon had stop and think there for a second if it was Oregon or Oregon State and it's kind of become the one that we all sort of show so let me walk you through it so if you look up here down in the lower left and it says teachers are able to use technology and under understand how it could be used for subject matter yet do not integrate it so this is at the beginning level of where we hand someone a computer a laptop and we say to them let us help you let us show you where the on button is let us show you where the how to use the trackpad well, let us show you how to so on so on so on teachers form and this is so important 
teacher's form a favorable or unfavorable attitude toward using technology for teacher and learning their subject matter. This goes back to that tweaking the knobs. If we don't give teachers an opportunity to see how it fits in the delivery of their content acquisition and how we can use it then to help kids in their demonstrations of understanding. Now, demonstrations of understanding, I use that term, that's a direct lift from the Wiggins and McTee. They do not rule out tests, okay? They're not saying, no, 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 tests are fine, tests are fine. But what we want to see is, do we see that the acquisition of knowledge, how it's delivered to kids, does it make sense so that in the demonstrations of understanding, they're not spitting it back they are turning it into their understandings of knowledge. How does Tech fit into all of this? As you can see up here, as you, all these lines are going every which way, you can see that this is where technology knowledge fits in. And then the recognizing knowledge, do you have a favorable or unfavorable attitude? So if no one does a good job of helping you understand the stuff that's put in your classroom, and that's everything from how do you turn the projector on? How do you make sure the projector and the computer get synced up? You know, this is stuff that as someone who is aware of it, I see all the time in people who are doing instruction. I always find it interesting that when I go into meetings here at this, unit, at this college and someone is up front and they're doing a big production that they're then sharing with all the faculty here, They'll wander over to me and they'll say, now, listen, um, I need you to be up front close because I'm not sure if this is going to work right. <laughs> well, first of all, I always have to sit up close anyway to be able to see what's on the darn screen. But I always find that fascinating that here we are, we're still at this level of unfamiliarity with the technology around us and part of me just wants to say well let's go find a kid you know that classic example of do you know how to program your vcr or your dvr now go find a 12 year old so what we're doing here is we at these first two levels first of all we're recognizing there's a knowledge set that we have to have and then depending upon how that knowledge set is presented to you, you may start then building connections into your content knowledge that you have. Now, at this point, if we present the technology knowledge that you need to have in a um, way that is degrading or is incomplete or is wrong, you can forget you can forget all the stuff that I can do after that point to get you to use technology. Folks, I've done, I've done the research. And then what we're trying to look at now is, because most of us are coming to the table, to the classroom, with understandings about technology use. By that I mean, I know what a keyboard is, I know what a mouse is, I know what the World Wide Web is. You know, we have those. How then are we viewing that knowledge with delivery of content? So if we get through those first two, in other words, we move on to accepting, teachers implement tech into their classroom instruction, leading them to a choice to adopt its use for teaching that content. So teachers make a conscious decision that I will use this technology in my classroom to teach my content. So now we move into a different kind of content use where teachers are going out and finding uh, online resources. Desmos, the online, you know, graphing calculator pops into my mind right away. But there's lots and lots of others, you know, um, different ways of organizing kids with graphic organizers. 
you know, all this kind of stuff that we could sit here and go on and on and on about. This is where when we see teachers accepting that into their teaching, then we've made the first step out into accepting technology. But what, what are we leaving out here? We've talked about content and technology. Okay, I can see how I can use this piece of technology to enhance my content. Finally, we have the advancing. So at this point, we start seeing teachers making revisions into their curriculum because they now see the pedagogical advantages that the, the use of technology may gain them in the presentation of content. So now we see the final slide in. We see that pedagogical dance that then is supported by technology use. Doesn't have to be. Pedagogical dance can occur, remember, 1987, that's when he wrote it. Well, there was technology then, but that's not what Shulman had in mind. Shulman was looking at that whole content pedagogy dance. He wasn't looking at technology. But we can now see that this is how the pedagogy and the content and the technology can now start coming together. And then finally, we see that teachers actively integrate technology designing their own ideas. And that's where we want to be. We will eventually, in one of these modules, talk about Google Classroom. And I can't come up with any better example of TPAC than the Google Classroom implementation. It is such a good example. Because the Google Classroom, when you look at it, is extremely simple. There's just not a whole lot you got to know to utilize the Google Classroom. But boy, there sure is an awful lot of pedagogical underpinnings there that you've got to look at how you're going to use it. It can be as simple as a simple turn in. You know, some people will say, well, I can't use it. I don't have computers in my classroom. Kids don't have computers. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, what are you going to do about uh, the kids who don't have digital access when they go home? Fair enough. You know, you've got to weigh all the in this there's no panacea here there's no i'm going to walk in and we're going to be, do technology in the classroom and everything's going to be great we're reaching convergence though a heck of a lot faster than we thought we were going to this idea of every kid having a device when they're in a school is rapidly becoming reality and you know it's it's to me, it's fascinating, um, the ebbs and flows of, of education, uh, 21st century learning, which now everybody is like, well, that was interesting. Um, no child left behind. There's another good one. Uh, I had a gentleman who was in my classes that I, when I was teaching it, um, who was here the other day, and I ran into him, and he took the information he learned from my classes to go off and actually start a business, online business, helping school districts implement No Child Left Behind. And he did some really interesting things. Um, and, you know, do I take credit for it? Just a little bit. It was his creativity. But his underpinnings were stuff that he got from me. So it makes me feel good. Well, long story short, his business doesn't exist anymore because neither does No Child Left Behind. So we see these ebbs and flows, but what we are seeing is this convergence. The technology is, will always be, and then people will scream and yell about privacy, security, again, no arguments. But at some point we have to realize that what education is all about, using Wiggins and McTeague as my model, is acquisition of knowledge 
demonstrations of understanding of knowledge, and then transfer of knowledge. And that's a whole class, by the way, EDAP 688. But what we're looking at there when we, we look at that model is perfectly fits into the TPAC idea that technology allows for creative ways of acquisition of knowledge that we never even could have imagined 15 years ago. Heck, even 10 years ago. Couldn't even imagine. The demonstrations of knowledge, which is where Wiggins and McTeague put their both feet into the technological waters because they have something they call facets of understanding. And a lot of those demonstrations of understanding are built around that they could be done with technology, don't have to be. And then of course, transfer of knowledge then is looking at all the different ways that I can demonstrate that my understanding can be transferred to a real world purpose. Okay, um, let me show you this. This is a T rubric. And this was developed by a lady by the name of Judy Harris. Um, Judy is right up there in the pantheon of all of this um, research. Uh, Judy was Texas. She's now over at Virginia Tech. Um, she is one of those seminal people. Yeah, I hope you all are, are getting bored with me throwing all these names at you. But these are the people who, who write about this stuff. And if you're interested in this stuff, you need to go back and look at what they have said. Because, um, you know, like I said, Michael Fullen is the inveterate name dropper. But he does exactly what researchers do. He goes out and he finds what people have written about, what people have talked about. Judy Harris is one of those people. And let me give you an understanding of Judy and how she fits into all this. First of all, she took the whole TPAC thing and kept it alive. She and Maggie did. Um, and so what she is famous for is that we must move kids from being, in, and she's talking about this in, in terms of of technology use. We must move kids off of being hunter gatherers to being more uh, developers. So hunter gatherers goes back to the original notion of kids using the internet to find information. Um, back in the day um, we had the idea of kids doing scavenger hunts using the World Wide Web to find things. And there was a whole school of developing content for that. Um, Bernie Dodge out of San Diego State University. And then Judy comes along, she says, well, that's all well and good for one level. But what we really want to do is we want to move kids to that creating and demonstrating using technology. So let's look at what she came up with. So if we look at, and you know, obviously the, the rubric is something you're familiar with, the look of it, you know, the four, three, two, and one, uh, four being the highest, one being the lowest. So when you look at curriculum goals and technology, curriculum-based technology use, is technology selected for its use the instructional plan that are strongly aligned with one or more curricular goals? So am I using technology to embrace and reinforce a curricular goal. Kids should be able to find information and use information to further their understandings. When you look at instructional strategies and technology, is technology use optimally supporting instructional strategies? I, I, I also look at this in the, the context of what Michael talks about in his book, Dr. Fullen talks about in his book, The Skinny. Do we see technology being employed in a way that it's efficient? Is it ubiquitous? 
do we see that when kids come into the classroom and the teacher says, we're going to be working in groups, we're going to be employing, she won't say employing the pedagogy of collaboration, she'll say we're using collaboration, we're going to be working in groups, and I want your group to come up with their understanding of what we've been learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> what do kids do? Kids immediately go, and usually it's not a grand rush. It's There's one guy or one gal who is in charge of the cart, and they go over and they start handing out the laptops to the kids in the classroom. All this is done very routinely. There's no big deal. There's no, you know, big kerfuffle about the whole thing. It's just John is handing out the laptops. Okay, um, we're working together. Let's let's get into the Google Slides and let's start looking at how um, Sally, you'll create the Google Slide structure and then share it out with the rest of us. That's the skinny. That's the skinny. That's what Dr. Fullen wants to see. And that's what instructional strategies and technologies are all about. Now, technology selection is, again, curricular compatibility with curricular goals and instructional uh, strategy. So, again, are we using tools here that are appropriate to what we're trying to do? And finally, the fit. And this, to me, the fit and the skinny are very synonymous to each other. So do we see that the technology, the content, and the pedagogy, they fit? It's not we're trying to shoehorn something in. Hey, let's go do this because it's cool. Um, when we get to that module, you'll hear my take on it. Virtual reality now is hot, 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 all over the place. And I sit and I see where schools and school districts are buying hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of equipment so that kids can experience virtual reality. My question is very simple. To what point? What's the curricular goal? Well, we can walk among the pyramids. Well, no, actually you can't, but okay. Um, what's the point? Walking among the pyramids, how does that help me understand, A, how old they are, what they represent, and how do they fit into this world? I'll give you a quick one on that. My... My baby girl, well, she's 30 years old, but she'll always be my baby girl. Um, as a part of her university work at Northern Kentucky University, got to uh, travel to Egypt during the uh, original Arab Spring that went on in Egypt. Now, my daughter is this, uh, she, she is her mother. She's this beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, strawberry, actually, haired, blue-eyed girl. And... When she got into Egypt, she just she just couldn't believe how much she loved it. And so, of course, being her, her daddy, who's sitting at home thinking about all those wicked people that are there in Egypt and what they might do to my lovely little daughter. And my daughter was using Facebook to every day send back pictures about the wonderful, warm people that she met. And how she got invited to attend a mosque. Um, she had to wear a hudju, you know, but that's fine. And I, you know, you just realized at the power that we had. And I think that's what makes me so mad about what Facebook has become. Because it started out with this incredible idea. But here's my point. She had this wonderful little video that she shot where she's standing in the parking lot where you go to go see the pyramids and the Sphinx. And first thing you're struck by is a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. And then she takes the camera. So you, you, the shot is you're looking at the Sphinx and in the background, you see the three, you know, pyramids. And then she takes the camera and she turns it 180 degrees. So you can see across the street from the parking lot, is a KFC. 
that is a moment where the technology fit just screams at you, especially if you're a social studies teacher, especially if you're talking about cultures. Great. One of those moments where you just kind of smile and go, okay. All right. This is the assessment rubric that, as I said, Judy came up with that people could go in and sit down and, and look at classrooms. There's a problem here. And if you kind of read over, you can see that a lot of the various um, scorings are rather vague, rather vague. And so when this, this came out, um, there was a lot of discussion about we need something better. And this is where we're going to end tonight and where we'll pick up next week. And so where we picked up or where we went to to look at something that might be better was this. So this is Tim. It will not take me long next week to explain Tim to you because now you've had the TPAC. And you'll understand where the TPAC was lacking. The Tim takes that and tries to pick up with it. And by that I mean what it does is it does look at the different pedagogies. Whereas the TPAC kind of just sort of has a general kind of, well, are we looking at pedagogies and technology? so on. When you look at this, what you'll see is you'll see that you have the um, different pedagogies that could be employed and then how are they employed and how is technology em employed to have those happen. We'll do that next week. Uh, what I would like you to do, please, is take the time. I'll show it to you one more time right here. It's five minutes long. Okay. It's five minutes long. And it will do a very nice job of helping you understand or help you to see um, everything we've just talked about tonight. Also, uh, if you want to hear, this is a great presentation. Don't get me wrong. It's a great presentation. Um, if you want to sort of dip in and dip out of it to watch it. Uh, this is this will be where we will be going for our what we're going to do with all of this when we get ready. This is how you're going to demonstrate your understanding of TPAC, TIM, and UDL. And this is a wiki. Um, and in this wiki, we have a bunch of videos. And what we're going to be asking you to do is to search through these various videos looking for examples of either TPAC in use, TIM, and or UDL. You don't have to find them all together. Uh, there's a couple in here that can do that. But what you're going to be looking for is um, videos that support the ideas behind TPAC, the ideas behind TIM, and the ideas behind UDL. Now, having said that, because everybody wants to know this, can you find the negative? Absolutely. So if you want to go in and find a negative video, in other words, a video that absolutely just is abhorrent to you in terms of, man, that's not even close to TPAC, not even close to TIM, not even close to UDL. In other words, it violates every one of those kinds of principles that those stand for. You, you feel free to do that because you're going to use a tool and the tool that we will be using is called blend space. And with the blend space, we can, here it is, we can put together all of these ideas into a really nice format that becomes a way of understanding um, how we can view these things. And blend space is a really nice way 
of you being able to use it with your kids because they can basically um, use it as a way of putting together their understandings as well. It's a really nice, nice little tool. I like it a lot. Uh, and of course, you know, as always, um, you'll be able to get something out of the blend space that can end up um, being sent to you or being put posted into a Google Classroom uh, assignment, so on and so on and so on. That, that's the other reason why I like it a lot. Okay, so that was tonight's look at our alphabet soup, our first sip of our alphabet soup. We just did TPAC. When I see you next week, we will dive into the Tim. It won't take me as long to do Tim as it does TPAC. So therefore, I'll do Tim and UDL together next week. Um, and then I will show you how to do the uh, blend space. We'll slow down. I'll walk you through it step by step by step so that you can um, put together your understanding. And then we'll make sure we understand where it fits into the assignment here in our Blackboard space. Um, and as we've already have all agreed upon, that you don't have to have it turned in until the end of class. Um, I, I was looking at where we are in terms of the calendar, etc. We will have plenty of time uh, at the end of these modules that you'd be able to get things together. I just don't want you to wait to the very end and, and slop things together. So if you'll just take the time to go in and look at um, the creation spaces and think about what you're going to create with them and learn how they work. I think that's where I really want you to be right now. If you'll just understand how to work a picto-chart, uh, excuse me, an infographic within picto-chart and how to develop a presentation within the blend space. The blend space is a heck of a lot easier than the uh, infographic is. I'll tell you that right now. Understand how to do those things then I'll feel much better about you waiting uh, later in the course to actually create <coughs> the uh, thing that we're working on. Um, and also, I'll make sure that I go through and go through the rubric that will be in the assignment for Module 2 so you understand what it is that I'm looking for. As always, as always, if you have any concerns, comments, if you need to meet with me virtually in this space or to Google Hangouts or physically sitting in my office, um, all you got to do is drop me a text at 502-457-2937. If it's the first time you've ever texted me, make sure you just say, hi, this is so-and-so in your class. And that way I can create a, a contact for you so I'll know who it is that's texting me in the future. I'm always here for you. I'm always here to help you understand this stuff. Uh, felt good about TPAC tonight. Um, TPAC, you can really get, as a researcher, you go in a very different direction with TPAC. What researchers do with TPAC is they look at it. If you look at that model that I showed you, the three circles and all of that, there are 12 possible intersections there. And so what a researcher will do is they will go off and find one of those intersections and that becomes the basis of their research. Uh, if you try to take on the whole TPAC model into doing some kind of research, the pieces, as I think you saw there with the rubric, I hope you saw that, uh, the rubric is that you would use looking at something through the lens of TPAC is a little wanting. And frankly, I haven't seen anything better from anybody else. Um, and I stay up with this, really stay up with this. Uh, the Tim, I could take the Tim and walk into a classroom tomorrow and get, get good solid data out of it that I could then plug into TPAC. That's enough, I think, for the, for the night. Stephen, I hope you feel better. Um, goodness gracious, I don't know how you've sat through me yammering away at you for this, uh, however long we've been doing it. And I hope you get over the flu. And I hope to see everybody next week. Stay healthy. I'm going to go ahead and sign off, Steve.